All right. Thank you guys so much for coming tonight and welcome to our Credo Plus events. So for anyone who isn't a part of UTS and who do not know Credo, so Credo is a Christian um, minister society that we do and we do lots of interesting events as well. Um, yeah, so um, tonight we're going to be having uh, a very exciting debate um, on whether Jesus is the promised Messiah and is brought by uh, Rabbi Tovia Singer and Sam Green. Yeah, so um, also just thank you guys so much if you are actually not a part of UTS and you're just coming here today for the event and yeah, we really appreciate it. All right, um, yeah, so, yep. Um, yeah, so um, before we get everything started, I'd like to pay acknowledgement of the country. Um, and by doing that, I want to read out this beautiful verse. So it is from Psalm 24, verse one to two. The earth is a Lord and everything in it the world and all who live in it for he founded it on the seas and established it on the waters yes yeah, so it is just a beautiful verse to remind us that how God has created this place at the same time as we have the privilege tonight of meeting together in peace to engage with important questions and discussions I think let us always remember that the land we meet on was not acquired in peace so may the indigenous people of this land always have the special place of honor to us since under God they first stewarded this land and we meet tonight and they belong to it great and now I'd like to uh, all of us to get to know both of our presenters better. So can I invite Rabbi Tovia Singer to come up to the stage and I can give you a little interview? Great. Hello. Yeah, so um, I have been just reading a bit of you. Uh, so apparently you are the founder and director of Outreach Judaism. And I'm just wondering what do you do with that? Right. So Outreach Judaism is a is a Christian organization. I'm kidding, that was just <laughs> joking. It's a Jewish organization. Are these jokes too complicated for over here? No, okay. It's a Jewish organization dedicated to reaching out to Jewish people all over the world, but specifically to helping Jews who have converted to the Christian religion return back to the Jewish faith. So we're a very unique organization, and I've devoted my entire adult life to helping Jews and many people who are children of Noah return back to Judaism. Right. Um, and you are basically in Indonesia now, working on outreach Judaism. Why would you choose Indonesia out of all? What would a, a Jewish boy from Brooklyn, it's hard to tell from my British accent, but it's true. <laughs> what would I be doing in Jakarta, Indonesia? So as it turns out, the fourth largest country in the world is home to many islands and many peoples. And on the island of Papua, there are many, many Jewish people who are descendants of Peruvian Jews who fled hundreds of years ago and sought to return back to their Jewish faith. Indonesia, since its independence following World War II, did not recognize Judaism officially as a religion. So these now Indonesia is a country which really has opened its arms up and allowed us to go and so that people can learn about the truth of the Torah. And I came there to teach and they asked me to stay on as their rabbi. So I had no competition. I said, okay, I'll come. <laughs> right. Oh, wow. So I have two silly questions for you as well. Um, so today, apparently this is the first time you're coming to Sydney. What was your first impression of Sydney? Not so good. <laughs> I really expected much more of this. You have a beautiful airport, it's unbelievable. And from the airport to here, it's unbelievable. I never saw such a thing, a highway, I never saw such a thing in my life. It's really an amazing place. I, I, this is the first time to Sydney, but I've been to Australia a number of times, from conducting a wedding on the West Coast to diving your reefs in, in the Great Barrier Reef. It's just a very beautiful, really a beautiful country and a beautiful people and I'm very grateful that you've in, invited me to be here and join you here this evening. Oh, well, thank you so much for traveling all the way um, to come here as well. So last question, name your favorite city because we know that you have been traveling all over the places just to do, do different debates and talks. Just name your favorite city. Favorite city? Favorite city. <laughs> What's my favorite city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. <laughs> 
Yushalayim is very delicious, very beautiful. That's the place where heaven and earth touch each other. That's the place that God has pointed to. It's a place that where Abraham brought his son for an offering, and it's the place that King David founded. It's the place of our scripture, and it's our destiny as Jerusalem. Oh, thank you so much for your answers. Yeah, it's great to get to know you a bit better. And now I'd like to invite Sam Green to come up for a similar interview again. <laughs> okay, hi, Sam. Hello. Hello. Yeah, and uh, apparently you're from overseas as well. Can you talk about where you're from? <laughs> so I'm from Tasmania. <laughs> Uh, which is technically overseas, yes. Overseas, yes. Um, yeah, so you are the founder of Engaging with Islam. Uh, can you talk a little bit about it and what do you do? Sure. So it's Engaging with Islam, uh, which is not Engaging with Judaism, but there, there is some overlap in that I have been debating publicly for quite a number of years now. And Tovia Singer and I got to know each other through a mutual friend, and uh, we decided to, to organise this event. So, um, yeah, I, I normally work across the universities of Australia helping Christians to uh, understand Islam and how to talk to their Muslim friends. It's very exciting. So, is this the very first debate with Jewish? Uh, I, I want to say yes. It's the first time I've certainly debated a rabbi. Um, I've had other debates, but they've been with imams or somebody else. So I've, I have debated on a number of occasions. Um, and it's related material, but I think that in many ways this is much more specific in that we're able to uh, come around the, the, a common scripture in a way that I, I can't with Muslims. And so I'm looking forward to this. Awesome. All right, last question, just a silly question as well. Would you ever move to Sydney permanently from Tassie? <laughs> um, it, yes, I would. I mean, I grew up in Blacktown, okay. so I am from I am from Sydney, and I often think of coming back here. Um, <coughs> but I've been away for twenty years, and it's it has changed a lot. And there's a lot more people in here. It's a lot busier than it used to be. As well. there's, yes, there's high, plenty of highways. So, yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Well, we we're both very excited for the debate and everything. <laughs> So before we start the debate, I'd like to invite the president of UTS Jewish Society, Gabby, up. Um, yay! <laughs> Just to appreciate the friendship we have been having and in the past years that we have been do doing different events together. Um, yeah, just really great. Can you tell us a little about what events that we have been doing together? Yeah, so we've done Elephant in the Room. We also did Trivia Night last year, which was really great, um, super successful. Um, I just wanted to say welcome to both of you and also to our special guest, Rabbi Gutnik. Hi. <laughs> and thanks again for inviting us. Oh, thank you guys so much. <laughs> All right, now to get the debate started, I will hand it over to our moderator tonight. Thank you, Brianna. My name's Paul Winch. I'm an alumni of UTS and um, after UTS I studied several postgrad theological degrees, so it's my pleasure to be alum, uh, moderator tonight. And the topic is very important, because uh, no matter what uh, language you use, Christos, Christ, Messiah, Messiah, our topic tonight uh, about whether the role or the title or the designation or that identity or the description uh, Messiah belongs to Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago um, was a live debate. It was a live debate then and it's still a live debate. So it's a great that we can engage in it. And being based on uh, public events in history, of course, Credo invites such scrutiny uh, as we will be able to be afforded tonight. So thanks again for coming. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the Credo motto is Christ for UTS. So uh, will that motto be dropped or changed after tonight? Perhaps Credo will even dissolve itself as a student society here at UTS if Jesus as the Christ is fake news. So representing our Credo is Sam Green. Uh, he will be taking the affirmative and the contrary position, uh, Rabbi Singer. Let me just uh, outline some details about how the, the night will proceed. Uh, we do want open and honest discussion, and um, because this is a weighty topic, 
Some people might find that challenging. I do ask you to try and uh, respect the fact that the speakers have come a long way, they need to be able to concentrate. So please turn off your phones, hold your questions, your clarifications, anything for the end. There will be a question time and you will be able to speak uh, personally to our speakers at the end. Now this is a public event and it is being recorded, so it will be posted online. Um, we put up signs about that, I'm just letting you know verbally that now as well. Here's the format. Uh, both speakers will uh, give their openings for 20 minutes each. Then they'll have 10 minutes uh, responses. Then there'll be a second responses of five minutes. So 20, 10, five. Then we'll open it up for questions. I hope we'll have 20 to 25 minutes. And then there'll be concluding statements from each speaker for four minutes each. Um, under God, God being my helper, I'm going to uh, give them exact timing. And at the five minute, so when they've got five minutes to go, I'll just give them one tap. Uh, and then a one minute warning, I'll probably do two. Um, and then they should wrap up after one minute. Thank you. So without further ado, um, I'm going to invite Sam up to present his opening. Do you want the... I will. I'll yep. set this up very quickly. Well, good evening. And it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I want to thank the UTS Student Society Credo for organising this event. And I want to thank Rabbi Tovia Singer for coming from Indonesia to participate. The question before us tonight is, is Jesus the promised Jewish Messiah? That is, does Jesus fulfil the plans and promises God made in what Christians call the Old Testament and what Rabbinic Judaism calls the Tanakh? The message of Christianity, the Gospel, proclaims that Jesus is this promised Messiah and that through his life, death, resurrection and ascension, God has done what we have failed to do. Jesus is the faithful, obedient remnant of Israel. He has conquered sin and death and brought the resurrection, eternal kingdom of God. He's brought the new <coughs> creation. And all who put their faith in him will share in this kingdom. Rabbinic Judaism, on the other hand, uh, does not accept this. It says that Jesus does not fulfill the Tanakh and that instead the faithful remnant of Israel can be obedient and righteous and keep the Torah to, to bring the Messiah. Tonight I'll be defending the Christian position and the outline of my position is as follows. Uh, my first point will be the testimony of John the Baptist. My second point that the uh, the, the, the scriptures foretell that the Messiah will suffer before entering his glory. I will then look at how this gospel message is confirmed and then I'll bring up two points of objection. I want to acknowledge at the beginning that I am a Gentile and that the Jewish people have a special place among the nations of the world as God's light to the nations. But I want to testify that I have received the blessing of this light through the Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that I now begin my presentation. So my first point is uh, that Jesus is the Messiah because of the testimony of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a prophet in Israel at the time of Jesus, and he identified Jesus as the Messiah and more. And so through this, this is God's confirmation through his prophet, that Jesus is the Messiah. John, in fact, was the fulfilment of the coming of Elijah. This promise that Elijah would come again is found in the prophet Malachi, where God says that he will come in judgment to his temple and that before he comes, he will send his messenger. And so in Malachi chapters 3 and 4, we read about uh, the one whom God will send in preparation for his coming to his temple in, in judgment. And uh, God says that he will send Elijah, the prophet. And so the Christian claim is that John the Baptist is this prophet Elijah and that he testified that Jesus is the Lord coming to his temple in judgment as the Messiah. Now, how can we know that the Christian claim is true? How do we know that this prophecy of Malachi comes to its fulfilment with John and Jesus? 
Well, it's because this prophecy in Malachi has a deadline by which it must be fulfilled. What I mean is it speaks about these things happening before the time before the second temple is destroyed. And so because it's happening before the second temple is destroyed, it, it, it has to be if it's a true prophecy, it has to be fulfilled before that temple is destroyed. Now the Christian claim that John the Baptist is the Elijah and Jesus is the Lord Messiah fits within this framework. However, rabbinic Judaism does not accept John or Jesus as far as uh, certainly jo uh, Jesus, but John as far as I know. And uh, to me, this seems to give it a problem. The problem is, as we have seen, this prophecy must be fulfilled before the second temple is destroyed. And I would like to hear from Tavia how Malachi 3 and 4 is fulfilled if it's not John and Jesus. As far as I can see, it's only the Christian claim that John is the prophet like Elijah and Jesus is the Messiah that fulfills the prophecy of Malachi in the correct time frame. And I cannot see any other historical candidates and cannot see how there can be any historical candidates now that the temple is destroyed. So this is my first point, that John the Baptist testified that Jesus is the Lord Messiah. My second point is that the suffering and resurrection of Jesus was foretold in the Old Testament or in the Tanakh, and this shows that Jesus is the Messiah. Let me just read to you some, some verses from Luke chapter 24. Jesus said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. So how do we see this? How do we see that the scriptures say that the Christ must suffer, the Messiah must suffer, and be raised on the third day? Well, we see it, first of all, in the pattern that God establishes for those who deliver his people. The, the, what, one of the ways that the Tanakh works is that it establishes patterns. So there's the seven days of creation, which establishes a pattern for for us and how we live, keeping seven days to the week. And then the prophets pick up the seven times sevens. And so it, it, it gives patterns. We also see patterns around other numbers, like the numbers 3, 12, and 40. And consider Adam. God just doesn't tell us how marriage is to be established. He gives us the, the story of, of Adam and Eve and how Adam is created and how his wife is brought to him. And that becomes the pattern for one man, one woman. And, um, and we see this within the, in Genesis itself, where it talks about, it gives the pattern, and then it gives the instruction to keep the pattern. Now, we see this pattern when it comes to the deliverer or the Christ-type figure in the Tanakh. Consider Joseph. Joseph is given a promise of glory. Joseph as a, promise, uh, Joseph as a prophet is given a promise of glory that even his parents will bow down to him. His uh, his brothers are envious of God's choice. They reject him. They, they think that they will kill him at first, but then they sell him off into slavery. And Joseph suffers. He's given the promise of glory, but suffering comes before. He, he's shown to be innocent in that when, Pot, um, when uh, Potiphar's, Potiphar's wife uh, says to him, uh, you know, come sleep with me, we see Joseph's righteousness and so he's, he's the innocent one suffering his brothers and father think that he's dead but then the one they thought was dead was alive and so we see that Joseph enters his glory after enduring his suffering and then he actually brings salvation to all the nations as he delivers food to from Egypt to everyone so here we have this this pattern now we see it again with Daniel don't we uh, with Daniel we see that uh, the, the king says to Daniel, I'm going to make you sit at my right hand with all power and authority. And what happens? The other rulers get envious of Daniel and they, uh, they set up false charges against him and they start causing him to suffer in various ways. But Daniel's innocence is seen in that uh, he's shown to be innocent and he did nothing wrong. But everyone thinks he's going to die because he's put into the lion's den and the assumption is he's going to die but that's not how it works out the one you think is dead is actually alive and he is lifted up out of the um, out of the the lion's den and brings salvation for the Jewish people 
And so again, we see that God works through one man to bring salvation uh, for his people, and in the case of Joseph, even further. Now, we see this again, of course, with David, don't we? David is anointed as the king of Israel. But of course, th this leads to the envy of King Saul. And so you know the verse, Saul has killed his thousands, David his tens of thousands. And so there's this envy from Saul who wants to kill David. And so David suffers as his friends and the, the people who help him get slaughtered by Saul. And so David suffers and we read about his suffering in the book of Psalms. Twice we see David's innocence, don't we? Remember when Saul goes into the cave and when he's sleeping in the field and David has the opportunity to kill God's Messiah, but he will not grasp at the kingdom. He will not. He is innocent in that regard. And so, uh, and so he is, he's given the promise of glory. He's envied. He rejects it and suffered. He is innocent. But then his time of glory comes. And uh, 1 Chronicles 14 Verse 2 says that God had lifted up David for the sake of his people. And so as Tavia said, um, David, um, uh, David establishes Jerusalem and establishes in, in the kingdom of God on earth in a way that nobody had done before him. Now, this is the pattern of the deliverer that, that God sends to his people. This is the pattern we see repeated several times throughout. And it's not just that it's repeated in the scripture. Because David actually talks about his sufferings a lot in the Psalms. And so the sufferings of David actually get turned into prophecy. Because his sufferings aren't just what happened. They're actually, he now writes them up as scripture. And it, this now becomes prophecy. The sufferings of David becomes prophecy. He is, the, he is a messianic figure. He is a prophet and his psalms speak about the suffering of the Messiah. In fact, prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel, they simply just call the Messiah David. They just call him David. And so this pattern that we see with David is the pattern that we can expect for the Messiah. And this is actually what we see in Jesus' life, if you've ever read one of the gospel accounts. He is given the promise of glory as the Messiah is given the promise of glory. There are people who envy him, people who envy him. He, he, he's rejected and suffered, uh, suffers. He is innocent. He doesn't grasp at the kingdom but waits for God to give the kingdom to him. And so in walking this path, he is the one man who on behalf of God's people and for the nations receives the salvation that we need. And so there's salvation before entering his glory. But of course... The kingdom that Jesus brings is not just a simple repeat of the kingdom of David. The Messiah is bringing the new creation, the resurrection, eternal kingdom of God. And so the Messiah is the first to rise from the dead into this resurrection age in the same way that Joseph and Daniel were the first to go through their, 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 their act of salvation. So too Jesus as the resurrected king is the first one to go through uh, the resurrection on behalf of others. His resurrection on the third day uh, is because the, the, the third day in the Old Testament, the Tanakh, is the day of confirmation. Just as 7, 12 and 40 have special meaning, so does 3. So it was the third day that Abraham sacrificed his son. Joseph and his brothers are talking on the third day. It was the third day when God came down to uh, to, to the Israelites in Sinai. Jonah is in the whale for the third day. Esther pr uh, fasts for the third day. And of course, there's Hosea, which says, Come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. The third day is the day of confirmation. And this is the day that Jesus rises from the dead. Now, I've tried to give there not just individual verses, but the big sweep, the big sweep of how the narrative uh, develops and, and teaches within the Tanakh and to show how Jesus' life fulfills this. In fact, I would want to argue that if the Messiah is not going to suffer before entering his glory, then what evidence would you have for that? What evidence would you have for the Messiah not suffering before entering his glory? I now want to move on to my third point. Um, and I want to look at the, the confirmation of what I've just said. How can we be confirmed? And there's three points I want to look at here. 
The first one is the confirmation of prophecy. And in particular, I'd like to look at Isaiah 53. And I'd just like to read you some verses. This is from the prophet Isaiah, many hundreds of years before Jesus. And it speaks about someone. And let me just read a few verses. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence and no deceit was found in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his day. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and for he will bear their iniquities. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for transgressors. There's just some selected verses because I don't have time to read all of it. But this is definitely somebody paying for the sins of others. You can't get away from that. It's definitely somebody paying for the sins of the others. And I'm saying that it's Jesus. It's not the nation speaking about how they have caused Israel to suffer. Because if we look in the previous chapter, we're told that the nations will be silent when they hear the message of Isaiah 53. And it's not Israel paying for their own sins because there's a distinction between the righteous servant and the nation. The righteous servant in the book of Isaiah is the Messiah. And it's only Jesus who has fulfilled this. And there are no other contenders. Five, five, good. Um, And so Isaiah 53 is a confirmation that Jesus fulfills the earlier prophets. My second confirmation is Jesus is a prophecy from Jesus himself. In, the, uh, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, it's recorded that Jesus foretold the destruction of the temple. Now, this is something that he could not control. That's beyond his control. Yet it happened. And I see this as a significant act of God. In terms of biblical history, the destruction of the temple is a significant act. And so I see this as a confirmation that Jesus is the Messiah. My second confirmation is the the miracles that Jesus did. Jesus was known for his miraculous signs. Uh, He delivered uh, people who had had leprosy or who were bleeding and they were unable to make themselves clean and the law couldn't make them clean. He was able to deliver them. He commanded spirits in the way that God does in the book of Kings, chapter 22. He commanded the storm in the way that God does in the Psalms. He fed the multitudes like Moses. And people were overwhelmed by these things. These signs were also a a confirmation with everything else that Jesus was the Messiah. The final point I want to bring up here is Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Now, when I say resurrection, I don't mean resuscitation. I mean resurrection in terms of new creation. And we have good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. There's the the testimony of his disciples. Uh, It fits in with who Jesus was and the power of God in his life. It was to be expected from the Tanakh. There's the conversion of skeptics. And there was also the change in his disciples. And um, I won't have time to read them out, but even... Secular historians like E.P. Sanders uh, hold that Jesus, there were uh, resurrection experiences. He can't tell you what they were, but he says something happened like a resurrection. And then, of course, there's uh, Pincus Lapide, who I read in preparation, and he also accepts the resurrection of Jesus. So again, the resurrection of Jesus is a confirmation that he brought the eternal resurrection kingdom of God and that he didn't fail. I want to finish up by looking at two uh, common objections that I've heard. The first is that the, the, the revelation that Jesus brings about uh, of God in terms of the Trinity doesn't match with the Tanakh. The Christian saying that there's the three in one, that it doesn't match. I want to say it actually does. Because if we look at Israel's experience of God in the Old Testament, it was triadic. There wasn't simply just a transcendent God up there. There was the transcendent God up there, but there was also the messenger of God's presence. And when people engaged with this messenger, they would say, I have seen God. And so we see this on many occasions, which I may look at uh, again. And Isaiah uh, chapter 63 verse 9 actually calls this messenger the messenger of God's presence. 
And so people had this, this engagement with this messenger of the presence of God. And of course, there's the Holy Spirit of God who speaks and can be grieved. So the, 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 the experience of God in the Old Testament was triadic. There was the transcendent God, the messenger of God's presence, and the Holy Spirit. My, my next point is that um, for God to say that God came to us as a man is idolatry. This is another one I've heard. And I want to say it's not idolatry. God walked with Adam in the garden. That's what it says in the Tanakh. God appeared to Abraham as a man. In Numbers chapter 12, verse 8, it says that Moses sees the form of God. Thus, God has come to us in different ways throughout the, the, the Tanakh, and none of these are idolatry. God is free to to come to us as he pleases. So to conclude, our question tonight is, was Jesus the Jewish Messiah? Tonight we've seen that the answer is yes for the following reasons. There's the testimony of John the Baptist. Uh, we've seen that the Tanakh uh, lays out the example that the Messiah will suffer before entering his glory. We've seen that this is fulfilled with prophecies like Isaiah 53 and Jesus' temple, uh, the prophecy of the temple, the miracles of Jesus and his resurrection. And finally, we've seen that the, the revelation of God that this brings is consistent, uh, though a further revelation of what we find in the Tanakh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Brilliant timing. And uh, for his opening presentations, let's have a special welcome all the way from Jakarta, Rabbi Singer. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Samuel. I really appreciate it. My mother appreciates it. We're very happy. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was very thoughtful. Thank you. I, I, whenever I travel, I, I do call my mom. And um, she asked me, where are you going, Tovia? And I said, I'm going to Australia. So she asked, there are Jews in Australia? I said, you wouldn't believe it. There are thousands of Jews in Australia. I'm going to Sydney. There are Jews in Sydney? I told her there are tens of thousands of Jews in Sydney. She then reminded me there were more Jews in her women's league. And it's a, a great joy to be here. Uh, thank you, Samuel, for having me here. I'm very, uh, very grateful to Credo here at UTS for inviting me to join you here this evening. It is a very beautiful country you live in. It really is. Paul, thank you very much. And Brianna, thank you so much for, for helping me. Um, find this building and, and making really all this possible. I'm very grateful to all of you. I, I want to share this one thing with you because I, I frankly have very rarely been to Australia in my life. The first time I came here, I conducted a wedding on the West Coast for a young man from Indonesia, a Jewish fellow, married a young lady from this country. And I'm not very familiar with this country. And when I say familiar, I don't mean with the roads and the byways and the highways. I meant I'm not familiar with the, with the cultural norms of this country. But it really didn't take me a very long time to realize that the people here are very, very special. That's not an opening line. That's from my heart. You've all been just so thoughtful and very helpful and I, I want to ask something of you before I begin. Obviously, I'm going to devote the little time we have together to help you understand why Judaism do, does not accept the Christian Messiah. I know that you are here because your religion is very important to you. I suspect that you've come here tonight because there's absolutely nothing more important to you than the God of Israel. I suspect that you're here tonight because your faith is your essence, and without it, you have nothing. And we're here to know the truth. But it is possible that I might say something here this evening 
that might offend some of you. It's just because your faith is so deeply important to you, and I respect that. So in advance, I ask you, please, to please forgive me if I say anything that God forbid in any way um, makes you feel bad. I don't want to. I just, but I do know that you don't want me to. You didn't come here for applesauce. You didn't come here for, for, just, for just an ecumenical, we all believe in the same God. The truth is that there's very significant differences. There are things, of course, that we share in common, and I'm very grateful for that, but there are very significant differences. And frankly, the, um, Reverend Green alluded to it, that if Christianity is a true faith, and Jesus is the Messiah, and he's the second person of the triune Godhead, you have to believe in him. And if you don't believe in him, you're damned. There's no hope for you. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8 describes an eternal lake of fire that will consume those who don't accept Jesus. There's no salvation outside of the church, outside of the cross, Mark 16. It's very, very clear. Okay? I, don't, we're not, I don't want to mischaracterize the Christian faith. Christians believe that Without the cross, there is absolutely no salvation, and you're going to go to hell. And whatever hell is, it's not a good thing. Conversely, if, if Jesus is not the Messiah, and the children, God is working with the children of Israel, and the church has mischaracterized God's plan for mankind, and God has a plan for you, and he loves you very, very much, young man. But he wants to connect you directly, no mediator. then worshiping Jesus is idolatry. It's the absolute worst thing you can possibly do to yourself. And although religions feel good for everyone, Samuel spoke about people who died and suffered. As it turns out, in every religion, there are martyrs and people who suffer and die for their religion. There's no correlation between if you suffer, therefore it is the truth. I'm an Orthodox rabbi. I want to tell you what that means. That means that we believe that the Bible is the word of God, period. We believe that Tanakh, the holy scriptures, the prophets of Israel, when they spoke, God used their voice as an oracle to convey to each and every one of us how God wants us to live our lives. And some things may not make sense, but God says, follow me. I'm showing you the truth. Our entire, our entire belief in our connections to God is based on Scripture, and that's what we're going to be looking at. It is not possible, I would, I would posit to you, to look at the Christian Bible, and from that you're going to prove the truth. You can't. You have to go to that text that we all know is the Word of God, the uncorrupted Word of God in that Scripture, Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures. Judaism could be true, and I'm afraid Christianity could be false. Christianity cannot be true and Judaism false. The Christ, unless you're a Marcionite, you cannot believe that the Christian Bible is true and the Jewish Bible is false. That's not possible. And therefore, you have to look at the postulate, at what is axiomatic. When we want to look at God, you cannot look to the book of John. You've got to look to the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. You've got to look at Exodus and, and, Jer and Jeremiah. You've got to look to the prophets of Israel. And then you examine these claims and ask yourself, do the claims of the church match with the Hebrew Bible? Are they consistent or are they opposed by the prophets of Israel? We have a Mashiach. Tanakh tells us exactly what's going to happen when the Messianic Age arrives. The Mashiach, we are told, he's going to give Teichacha to the nations. He's going to rebuke the nations. And as a result of that, open up Isaiah chapter 2. Tells us that what will happen as a result. Nation, nation will not raise up sword against nation, neither will they learn of war anymore. 
It's quite a difference. Ki mitzio in teitzi Torah, udevar Hashem Yushalayim, for out of Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of Hashem from Yushalayim. There'll be a world peace. Predators and prey will lie together. See Isaiah chapter 11. The world will be transformed in a way that everyone will know about the truth of God. Our holy prophet Siphania, Zephaniah, he lived the end of the first temple period. He was a contemporary of Yirmiyot of Jeremiah, tells us that all the nations will speak in a pure speech. V'hoyo Hashem l'melch ha'kol eretz. And God will be king of the whole world. On that day, God will be one, and he will be one. Zechariah chapter 14. These are the splendid prophecies that we're told all over Tanakh. And this, my friends, is what the Jewish people follow. And therefore, we examine all the claims of the church. Whether the, ch the claims of the of a Protestant church or Catholic church or any of the other religions. We say, ask our questions, does it match or is it opposed by the Jewish scriptures? The idea that somebody can die for your sins, is it this idea ever expressed in the Jewish scriptures? The prophets of Israel oppose such an idea of human sacrifice. The prophets of Israel warned us that the innocent person can never die for the sins of the wicked. If you want to see human sacrifices, you go to the islands off of Mexico where children were beheaded and virgins and babies were offered to fires. Never bad people, only good people. Why virgins and babies? Why not bank robbers and rapists? The reason is that this idea that the innocent could die for the sins of the wicked is pervasive in the pagan world. I apologize. I hope I haven't offended you. But Christianity did not invent a religion, but rather borrowed these ideas. And the prophets of Israel said, watch out, warning. The innocent person cannot die for the sins of the wicked. As Yechezkel, Ezekiel chapter 18 tells us very clear, clearly that the righteous person cannot suffer for anyone else's sins. No one can. Now the question becomes, if no one could die for anybody's sins, if no one could die for your sins, then what do I do? I'm in huge trouble. How am I going to get an atonement for our sins? Ezekiel, my dear friends, lived in a very critical time. He lived during the Babylonian exile. He lived at a time when the temple was destroyed. He was speaking to a nation who'd been shattered by watching King Solomon's temple destroyed. And he says these words, Kindlach, listen up, children who are created from above, not from below. The prophet says, as for the wicked person, what do you do? Now this would be a perfect time to say, I'm going to send Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and those who believe in him will be saved, and God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that anyone who would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If John 3.16 was in Ezekiel, I'd be in church right now. We all would. But Ezekiel gives us a completely different remedy. It is true, and this is important, that Christianity recognizes there's something called sin, just as Judaism does. The problem is that the, the remedy, the antidote that the church offers is much worse than the very sin itself. Ezekiel says, as for the wicked person, if he'll turn away from his sinful ways, he will surely live and he will not die in his righteousness that he did. In Christian theology, this is impossible. According to Romans chapter 3, the constitution of the church, no person can be saved by their own merit. You're going to be told that in church, and if you've never heard about it, you've never stepped into a church in your life. Is it my desire, Ezekiel says, this is the word of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, listen up, children of Hashem. Ezekiel says, he's speaking, when he speaks, not his lips, it's not important, he's a Novi, he's speaking the name of Hashem. Is it my desire at all that the sinful person should die? Is it not that he should turn away from his sinful ways that he might live? Doesn't sound very Christian to me. So that's what Tanakh tells over and over. No one could die for your sins. I just mentioned Shmuel. That's his real name, Samuel. <laughs> we said that John the Baptist is Elijah. I think I got that right. John the Baptist himself denied that in John 1.27. More importantly, if you look at Malachi, that's the last book of Tanakh. It's the last book of the prophetic part of Tanakh. In Malachi, we are told about this final day and what will happen. Who is this, this, this Malach, this messenger? These are the Kaihanim, these are the priests. 
We're told this explicitly in the book of Malachi, chapter 2, verse 7. That's the role of the priests. And Hashem is going to bring judgment finally in chapter 3, verse 1, to his sanctuary. There's nowhere in the book of Malachi or anywhere in Tanakh where it says that the Messiah has to come before the temple is destroyed. Maybe, I don't want to misrepresent it, maybe he meant Daniel, but that's also a misunderstanding of the text. There's nothing in Malachi. In fact, when we said, behold, I will send a messenger, we have the exact words at the end end of the book of Malachi, one point, keep in mind, a Christian Bible has four chapters of Malachi. We continue on all the way. There is no chapter four because the last five passages of chapter four are actually the end of chapter three. It's all one connection. And what's the second to the last verse of the whole of Malachi? Behold, I'll send you Elijah the prophet, Elio Novi. And what's going to happen? I'm going to turn back the sons, the children, back to the parents and the parents of their children. Did that happen at the advent of Christianity? Did that happen at the advent of John the Baptist? Were families reunited and everyone turning back to the God of Israel? Well, that didn't happen at all. It was quite the opposite. When the Christianity was established, it brought war, not peace. We have in Tanakh that there will be peace and a worldwide knowledge of God, and there will be a temple built. In fact, you correctly said in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, in fact, 21 times we're told that the Mashiach is the prince. It's the end of the book of Yechezkel, Yechezkel. And there we find that what will happen, the last three passages of Ezekiel, chapter 37, that I will build my temple in the midst of you, and then the nations will know that I am Lord. In fact, the last nine chapters of the whole book of Ezekiel is describing exactly what the base Hamikdash, what the temple will be like, and there'll be a return of all the nations will come to the base Hamikdash, and no one who is either uncircumcised of the heart or the flesh will be able to enter that sanctuary. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 9. Does that mean lunch is ready? Oh, five minutes. Okay. So here we go. So, so what we do is we look at we look at scripture. Uh, Samuel, my friend, uh, quoted from Hosea chapter 6 um, that on the second day, that on the third day will be revived. That He doesn't mean, I, nothing I say, God, but he's a real gentleman. I had the opportunity to speak to him. But this is all, it's, these are verses that Christians had to come up with. He didn't do this. This happened long before. Like Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says that Jesus rose on the third day according to scripture. There is no scripture like that. It does not exist. That text in Hosea, incidentally, Hosea lived at the time of Isaiah, is referring to Ephraim, it's referring to the northern kingdom, who were shattered during the first temple, they were carried away by the Assyrian Empire, they did not exist among us during the second temple period, but when the third temple is built, they're going to be returned, it's completely taken out of context, as is Isaiah 53. I want to convey this to you, Kindle. listen very carefully. If you have a book that has 66 chapters and you begin with the 53rd, what are the chances exactly that you're going to know what the 53rd chapter is about? I would posit this, and I would think it would be difficult to argue at this point, and that is, it is certain that Isaiah intended that if you read the 53rd chapter, that you would read the chapters that introduce it. We know exactly who the servant is in Isaiah 53. If you have a pen, this is the time you want to put it down to a paper. We want to know about the word of Hashem. And we look at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8 and 9, where it says that Israel, you are my servant. And then we go again a little bit further on. Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant. Look how the servant are witnesses. I want to say that again. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, my servant whom I have chosen. Should believe in me. Before me, no God was formed, there is neither one after me. Anochi, anochi, I, even I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no other Savior. Keep going to Isaiah chapter 40. It's so, so good. Isaiah chapter 40, verse uh, 44, verse 1. Uh, Israel is a servant. 44, verse 21. Israel is a servant. Isaiah 45, verse 4. Israel is a servant. Isaiah 48, verse 20. Israel is a servant. Isaiah 43, verse 9. 49, verse 3. Look at it right now and be saved and turn to HaKadosh Baruch Turn back to the God of Israel. What's happening? Who's speaking in Isaiah 53? And this is what gets people in a little bit of trouble. Because very often we don't ask a simple question of who veret, who is speaking 
in Isaiah 53. You have to look at the passage that actually that Samuel referred to. The people who are speaking in the 53rd chapter are the kings of nations. Who will be cast down and be shut down. So shall he cast down many nations. Kings will go, <gasps> will shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told to them, they will see. That which they have never heard, they will witness. And they'll ask the question of Isaiah 53 verse 1. Me, <laughs> Hashem, Hebrew is so gewaldig, so delicious, so good. Kindlach. Learn Hebrew, boy, better than Latin, better than French, better than Greek. Hebrew, the language that God created the world, Rabbi Yisraelim, Psalm 33, verse 6. You know how good Hebrew is? And make sure your children learn Hebrew. No more with the Latin, Italian, Puerto Rican, enough. This, that's not really a language. Learn Hebrew. So what's happening is, I, I confess, if you take Isaiah 83 out of context and don't read the servant, I think these are the fourth of her servant songs. Who is speaking? The nations of the world, they're shocked at the end of days. Why? Because what will happen is they will be, he's very close to that bell. How much time do I have to See, I know what's going on. The Lord laid it on my heart. Okay, so what's going to happen is when the Mashiach comes, the nation's going to be, who would have believed this? Who would have believed such a thing? Does that mean one minute or five minutes? One. So therefore, so therefore, my friends, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, what we do is we go to the Jewish crypt. We don't go to John. We don't go to Luke. We don't. How did Luke pred predict the Second Temple structure? Because Luke was written after the fact. That'd be like me. Yeah, I have a big prophecy. Nine eleven. What's the big deal? I'm writing today here in 2019. I can write about nine eleven. Luke was written after the fact. So therefore, to have a text written after the fact, that's not a big deal. The big deal is to talk about what would happen thousands of years later, as Isaiah did, as Ezekiel did, and as Jeremiah did. Anyways, I thank you all for joining me here tonight. And also, I acknowledge the Chief Rabbi of Australia, Rabbi Moshe Goodnick, is here. I thank you so much for joining. Thank you all for being here tonight. Bless you. Fantastic to um, have the cards on the table, and now we get to play with them. So, Sam is going to have a 10-minute uh, response, his first response. Again, I'll do a five-minute bell, which means halfway through this one, and then a one-minute bell. Thank you, Sam. Okay, well, thank you for that, Tavia. That was excellent that we can uh, be speaking this way. Now, I, I'm just going to pick up on the points that you raised and just spend the next 10 minutes uh, uh, responding to each one. You said that you, you, you addressed the audience and said, we don't need Jesus because you can connect with God directly. But I'm not sure how that works because even if we look at the, old, uh, at the Tanakh and the promises there, there is the priesthood. And so I think that it's not as direct as you may be saying, and maybe you could uh, elaborate on that for us because uh, it seems that the priesthood is part of the, the eschatological description that we have. You said that we must go by the Tanakh and do they match? And I, I want to say absolutely, I, I want to agree with you that we do need to go by the Tanakh. I don't think I quoted John to, in my talk tonight. Um, you're saying not to quote John and those other things. I, I mean, I quoted Luke to look at the claim Jesus made to take us back to the Tanakh. And that's what I want to do. I I'm, want I'm to uh, stand with you and say that the, the Tanakh is the word of God. And, uh, th and I want to say that uh, through Jesus Christ, it's been taken around the world. Uh, it, it has been taken around the world. This sort of fits into how does Jesus fulfill the Tanakh and it, it doesn't match about bringing peace and a temple and the nations coming in. Well, I want to say that when you read the Tanakh, the, the way that God fulfills his promises is not always how Israel expected. The way that God fulfilled his promises to Joseph was not how you expected. The way how he fulfilled his promises with, with David was not how you expected. Even when the Jews come out of Babylon, uh, you read in Isaiah that they grumble because Cyrus is the Messiah and they didn't want Cyrus as the Messiah. Woe to him who quarrels with his maker. And so, um, you know, the, there's a whole range of, of, of ways in which what God, the way God fulfills is not how you expect. And so I think we need to take that into account. Now, the idea of human sacrifice being wrong, uh, I, I don't know if... I, think, I want to say yes, but I want to be careful with that. 
because God commanded Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And did God command Abraham to do evil? I don't believe so. So there was something in that sacrifice, which means you just can't dismiss it. Um, you spoke about Ezekiel 18 and how in Ezekiel 18 it talks about uh, you know, uh, the father cannot bear the, the, the sins of the child and the child cannot bear the, the sins of the father. And I want to say to you, absolutely, you personally have to repent. But to just finish there is not actually what Ezekiel is saying. That's simply not what Ezekiel is saying because Ezekiel 18 is speaking to Jews who live under the Mosaic Covenant. And under the Mosaic Covenant, your repentance included going to the temple and offering up a sacrifice of atonement. So it wasn't simply you repent. Your, rep your repentance has content. And that repentance included offering up a sacrifice of atonement. Now, the sacrifices of atonement in the sacrificial system were pure and spotless lambs and, uh, and, and goats. And so they were, the, they were the best that was to be offered to God. And the way that the sacrifice would be offered, particularly on the Day of Atonement, would be that you would lay your heads on it and con it, the, the priest would confess the sins of Israel and it would bear the sins of Israel. And then one goat would be sacrificed, another would be sent out as a scapegoat. But there was a substitute sacrifice for sin. And this is what Christianity is based on, substitutionary atonement. Now, Jesus brings it to its fulfilment, and I, I will argue in a moment that this is, uh, that Isaiah 53 is about Jesus, but we simply can't turn to Isaiah 18 and say, repent, because Isaiah actually talks about atonement and the necessity of atonement. In fact, in Isaiah 16, just before it, let me just get this here, speaking about, again, the future and what God's going to do, it says, so I will establish my covenant with you, and you will know that I am the Lord. Then, uh, then I will make atonement for you for all you have done. And you will remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth again. And so we see there that there's actually a promise within, within Ezekiel that God is going to bring his own act of atonement. There's the, the atonement that the priests bring, but there's the atonement that God is going to bring. Now, Isaiah 53 for me uh, is not about the nations of the world. So Tovia was looking at the fact that Israel is called the servant. And that's absolutely correct. The nation of Israel is called the servant time and time again. But then when you read, when you read it, and he, he spoke about um, you know, not just reading Isaiah 53 on its own, but reading the whole book. That's what I've done. I've been reading Isaiah for the last 30 years since I became a Christian. And every second year I'll get through it and I'll sit down and read it. And uh, it, it's hard work. Isaiah is hard work. Uh, but there are two servants within here when you read Isaiah. There's one servant who is the righteous servant. There's the other servant which is sinful Israel. And it says, who is like Israel? Who is blind like Israel? And so there are two servants. Now, the verse that actually shows this is from Isaiah 49 verses 5 to 6. And you see the two servants in these verses. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant. And what's his servant going to do? to bring Jacob back to him and to gather Israel, for I am honoured in the eyes of the Lord and my, and my God has been my strength. It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob. See, the servant's got a ministry to Israel, to Jacob. I will also make you a light for the nations that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so we see here that uh, that, that, that there's this servant of this Lord, this righteous servant who's going to have a ministry for Israel and a ministry to the nations. Now, is Isaiah 53 the nation speaking? Well, I want to say no. And again, you're going to have to go and work this out yourself. Uh, we both believe that th this is God's word. But in Isaiah 52, we see that there's going to come a message of peace to Zion. It says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news and proclaim peace and bring good tidings and proclaim salvation, uh, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So there's this message coming to Zion. And then a bit later on, just a few verses later on, we read, uh, the Lord will bear his soul, holy arm. Where are we? 
I prepared this with a different Bible to this one. We see here uh, that the nations are going to be sprinkled. No, sorry, I'll, I'll have to find this verse. Oh, here we go. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. So there's this message that's coming that Israel's going to hear about, that the nations are going to hear about. And then it says, who has believed? Oh, and then, sorry, just before there, it says, um, uh, that for what the nations were not told, they will see. What they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And so the nations, they're going to be told something. They're going to hear something. And the message is Isaiah 53. It's not the nation speaking. It's the, it's, what, it's the message of what the nations speak. And that's the message of the gospel, that the Messiah of Israel has died for your sins and that's gone out around the world in fulfilment of that prophecy. I'll just quickly make some comments about Luke being written uh, after the temple was destroyed, we have no evidence for that. That is sort of your liberal scholarship of, of, of judging the ages of things. If we actually look at the events that happen within Luke and use that as our normal way of judging it, we come to a, a, a date of around 60 AD when we look at the events because Luke and Acts go together and Acts has got many historical things that we can plug into and see where it ends. Uh, that this is the normal way that people would date things. And so we're looking at about 60 AD. And particularly why I'm not keen on you using that argument is people use those same types of arguments for Daniel. When they say Daniel you know, wasn't written by Daniel because look what's in it. It must be written later or something like that. Or look at what's in Isaiah. It must be written at a later date. You know, we need to look at what Luke says on his own. And uh, when we do a, 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 a dating, it comes out at around 60 AD. Unless we want to try other methods, um, then we should at least flag that so people can understand those things. So um, uh, thank you for, for putting up with my, uh, with my rebuttal there. Again, I want to say that uh, I, I, we need to work this out from the scriptures, but I believe that when we do go to the scriptures, we see that Jesus is the Messiah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sam. I just I, I believe you were talking about Ezekiel 16 and 18 when you talking. You said Isaiah. Okay, sorry. Yes, yeah. Ezekiel. Okay, so just a quick clarification there. Thank you. I saw people looking up there, <laughs> the references. Okay, great. Um, as you can see, they're uh, they're they're really warming up, aren't they? Uh, which is great. Fantastic that we've come here for serious discussion. All right. Uh, so for for his uh, ten minute response, let's hear from Tavia. Thank you. I confess that um, that I'm I'm not exactly sure that I know exactly where to begin. Um, let me walk this along. I, we heard this evening that God it has human qualities to Him. Um, this cannot be the case. If he couldn't God do everything? He, the Bible says. The The glory of Israel will not lie. For he is not a man to change his mind. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. We heard this evening that how could God not be corporal? After all, it says, it says openly in a Torah, God forbid, that God was walking in the garden. Is a complete misconception. The Torah says it doesn't say that at all. In the Hebrew, it says that the that the Kol Hashem mishalech bagan, which means that the voice of God moved in the garden. Now it's true that Christian translators don't know what to do with the word mishalech. Mishalech means to go. Now normally you could put in words to go to walk, but it doesn't mean walking. I'm in a technical university, so human walk is with the gait of an inverted pendulum. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, the only way you could say walk, specifically walk, is mishalech beraglayim. Mishalech means to move, and it's talking about the voice of God that moved in the garden. Be very careful Without lushing quite throughout the Hebrew language, we're going to run into a lot of trouble. Isaiah 49 is a conversation between the servant and God. 
it is identified. You have to, the text specifically identifies the servant as Israel. Don't be afraid to look at Isaiah 49, verse 3. Because Yisrael calls the servant to be a light to the nations. That's the role of the Jew. What is the Jew here for? Why did Akkad Yisrael make this unique kingdom of priests? We are a priestly nation. Those are the words right before the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus chapter 19. That we are to be an oral a light to the nation, a covenant nation. Nation, Isaiah 42, verse 6. HaKadosh Baruch returns and the, the nation is going, we have to do this? Remember when God came to Moses and said, you need, I, be, I can't, how am I going to do this? Not only that, HaKadosh Baruch the Holy One, blessed be his name, says, and you also have to bring back Jacob. What's the nafkamina? And I say that for the, for the, the Aramaic speakers here. What's the difference between Israel, the servant, and Jacob? Because whereas the servant... We have a little Aramaic for the gentleman here in the back. Whereas the servant is the righteous remnant of Israel who will not lie and there will be no deceit found in his mouth. If you just look at these verses, it makes no difference. What Bible is Zephaniah 3, verse 12 through 16. If you read those, it will change your life. It says the remnant of Israel will lie in peace. They will commit no iniquity. This is what the remnant of the nation will be like. It's not talking about Noam Shamsky. It's not talking about Sam Harris, who is a Jew. Jewish, who's a Jewish person? By Jewish law, he's Jewish. And it turns out Christopher Hitchens was a Jew. This is not who we're talking about here. We're talking about those who are loyal to Hashem, those who walk in the name of Hashem. And the servant goes, whoa, wow, we can do this. So Hashem says, not only do you have to be an oral agayim like the nations, but we have to bring back the rest of Jacob. Rabbanishlein, what does Jacob mean? It means all 12 tribes means it's not enough. You got to make sure you know that Jew living in Sydney who hasn't been to a synagogue in years, who doesn't know about the God of Israel, you need to reach out to her. She's so much this young lady who's living in Bangkok. She wants to know so much about HaKadosh Baruch Hu. You need to tell her this. And if you continue reading Isaiah 49, you'll see the servant goes, well, how am I going to ever do such a thing? How is it possible? And I feel so rejected. It's the same word 53. It's unbelievable. I feel that I've, I've suffered of nations. The same words. How am I going to ever carry out such a mandate? And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, would a nursing mother have ever abandoned her child, verse, verse 13, would she ever turn away from a nursing infant? These two might forget, but I will never forget you. Our Bible has a promise, God will never forgive, never, never turn his back on you. No one needs to die for your sins. I just want you to come close to me. Surely I put before you life and death, good and evil, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14 and 15. You must choose life that you can, may live. I call heaven and earth as witnesses before you I place life and death, good and evil, you must choose life. We were told earlier that, that Abraham was told to bring Isaac as a sacrifice for sin. I don't know where that comes from. Isaac was never told to bring as an offering to atone for anyone's sins. No human being, there is not a single place in Tanakh that anyone could bring in a, a, sac, a human sacrifice. And the sacrificial system that we find in Tanakh is only for unintentional sins. See Leviticus chapter 4, not for intentional sins. I know this is I don't mean new to you in a condescending way, but this is not what goes across in church. The, cur the carbon chatos is for unintentional sins. And in fact, the Mashiach himself, when the Messiah comes, should be considered in our time, he, the, the Navi says, is going to bring a sin offering for his own sins that are unintentional and for the sins of the nation. The Mashiach is going to commit a sin unintentional, yes. Where does it say that? How did I ever miss such a prophecy? It says that openly in the prophets that the Messiah is going to bring many offerings, contrary to what Hebrews 10, 18 says, contrary to what Paul says in Romans 6, that there'll never be another sacrifice. What we find in Tanakh is that there'll be a base on major temple be built, and offerings will be restored to their full glory, chapter after chapter, Isaiah 40 through 48. And what's going to happen? Read Isaiah 45, verse 20, 20, excuse me, Ezekiel 45, verse 20, 21, 22, that the prince himself is going to bring an offering for unintentional sins, that are sins that come in me, Pesi, Bishaygeg, unintentionally. That means no one's going to sit intentionally in the Messianic age, but there could be people who make mistakes. Now, we ask the question, first of all, why would the Mashiach have to bring a sin offering for himself? He never is sinless, according to Krishna. But the answer is, that's not correct at all. The Mashiach is a great man of God, but every people make mistakes, and the 
the offerings will be restored. And you, I speak to the Christians here with love in my heart. You have to ask yourself, Rabbi Shalom, where does this come from? I never heard about this in a church, but it's right there in your Bible. You'll open it up. You'll see it there. The glory is all there in the text, but you do have to go through the chapters. And we need to ask ourselves the question, so the Torah says the following, the Novi says, Zichri Shani Ismailam, Isaiah chapter 40, no, 46, verse 90, he says, remember the former things. Remember that which is early. Don't forget it, there's no progressive revelations. Nothing changes. Don't add to it, don't take away from it. Why? Because I am God. And there is no other God. And there is no one like me. Nothing. If your preacher says that there's a, there are multiple persons of the Godhead, reject it completely. He's a good man. She's a fine woman. But unfortunately, when children are raised since they're a baby, when your mother tells you Jesus loves you, it's very, very powerful. And what, the, what Christians do is, I, I say it again if I offend you, but what they're doing is they're reading the Jewish scriptures through a Christological filter of, of the New Testament. You can get yourself in a lot of trouble. There's a Jewish saying that goes, why did God invent Mormons? so Christians will know how Jews feel. That's really what's going on. Oh, we're supposed to suffer and die in the Messiah. We're supposed to suffer and die in Joseph. That's just homilies. That's not, that's, that, you don't prove anything from that. And just the opposite. So moral say, you know what Joseph Smith went through? He was, she was killed. He died for his message. And David Koresh, maybe he's the Mashiach too. He was killed in Texas, in near Waco, Texas. He died in a fiery furnace. So maybe we should believe in David Koresh. And the United States is filled which these branch Davidians and they use exactly the same text you've heard here the answer is that these texts do not exist in the Jewish scriptures as talking about the Meshach in fact in Isaiah 53 verse 8 you quoted I will I'll do it too Isaiah 53 verse 8 ends with the words here the nations are speaking about Israel it's bigger there's more on this but it ends with me pesha ami negalamo those are the words me pesha ami the nations are speaking because of the transgressions of my people the Germans the Ukrainians Negalomo, they suffered. That's what the text says. But in fact, what the Christians' Bibles do is they change it. Mipesha ami negalamo, lamo means them, plural, esh dos lamai. And what did the church do? They want you to believe in Jesus as your Messiah. It changed the text. If you go to your King James, your NIV, NAB, ESV, it changes from, for the strangers of my people, they were stricken to he was stricken so you could believe in Jesus as your life and Savior. Let me turn to you, my, my holy brothers and sisters. King Solomon said the following, that when you don't have a temple and one day you won't, and he built it, but in chapter 8, verse 46 through 50, please read it for yourself tonight. As King Solomon says, one day you're going to be sent to land your enemies far and near. And there you're going to rethink yourself. But there's no base I make. There's no temple. What are you going to do if there's no temple? We heard you need a temple. Not true. Because King Solomon says, this is what you're going to do, Kedalach, when you're in the land of your enemies far and near. And you'll rethink yourself. Turn your face back to this place. This is why Jews face Jerusalem. We pray as Daniel did in chapter 6. And God will hear your prayers and forgive you for all your transgressions. No Jesus, no animal sacrifices. Thank you for putting up with me. Thank you, Tavia. Um, just a quick question. The chapter 8 there, was that 2 Kings? 1 Kings. 1 first King, first Kings, first Kings chapter 8. Thank you. Okay, we're going to have uh, one more section of responses. These will be only five minutes, so obviously they'll just be the one-minute bell. Can I uh, say that after these final responses, there'll be question time? Um, so the way that will work is uh, Brianna, just put up your hand. Brianna will, we've got a long lead here. Brianna will walk with the mic to you, speaking to the mic. Don't take the mic, just speaking to it. And what I'm looking for is uh, kind of a question back and forth. This question's for Tavia, this question's for Sam, that kind of thing. Just to kind of keep it fair. Um, if you have a question that you think is for both of them, say that. I'll give the mic to both. Okay. Final responses for five minutes each. Firstly, Sam. Well, thank you for that, Tovia. And uh, it's great that we can just talk about these things straight. Now, you were speaking about... Um, 
uh, God cannot be a man. And you quoted from 2 Samuel, or 1 Samuel, I believe, where it says, uh, God is not a man that he cannot lie. And, and that idea, I didn't quite get the verse number down. I want to say that that verse is saying God is not a man and that he doesn't lie. It's not a statement saying God can't become a man. And um, I'm, I'm not, I'll have to go and check the Hebrew, and so that would be a good thing to do to see if, Adam, if God walked in the garden with Adam or not. It seems to me from the, the narrative of the story that that's what's happening because uh, as Adam and Eve are banished from the garden, they're banished from God's presence. And Cain says, I will, you know, I'm being thrust from your face. And so it seems to me that God was in some way present. And certainly with Abraham, it says the Lord appeared to Abraham. Uh, so to, to me, God, because he is the creator, he connects with creation in a whole range of ways. Yeah, he connected with creation when he made it. He connects with creation when he sustains it. Uh, he, he, God is always connecting with creation. We don't have a Greek version of God where God is so transcendent he doesn't connect with creation. Right? We have a view of God that God is down, that God connects. He sustains our life. So the incarnation is really just the, the, the beautiful expression of the doctrine of creation, that God connects with his creation. Uh, you mentioned that the Jews are the light. Uh, and I want to say to you that absolutely, as I said in my opening statement, I see that the Jews are uh, God's special people in this world. And I've confessed, I, I say that, and say, and so for me, the Jews have a special place. But when I read the, old, uh, the Tanakh in the Old Testament, the righteous remnant aren't righteous enough. After thousands and thousands of years, the judgment of God remains and so we see that when Israel was under judges they came under judgment when they were under kings they came under judgment when they came back from exile they stayed under judgment and so God says in Ezekiel and other places that he is going to do what we can't he is going to come for us and do what we can't and that's what we see happening with Jesus so I want to say Jesus is the righteous remnant I want to agree with you and I say and want to say he is Jewish he is Israel coming to its fulfillment now, I never said that Abraham offered up Isaac as a sacrifice of atonement. I, I didn't say that. I said that Abraham offered his son, and I was doing that in response to you saying uh, about human sacrifice. And so I was saying, well, God commanded that, and I do not believe that God would command what's evil, and we've got to take the whole picture there, and that's not always easy. Uh, you mentioned that the sacrifices were for unintentional sins. That's actually not the case. I've had this question before. Um, so in Leviticus chapter 5, it says, If a person sins because he does not speak up when he hears in public a charge to testify against something, um, then he will be held responsible. And then in chapter 6, uh, Leviticus chapter 6, the Lord said to Moses, If anyone sins and is unfaithful to the Lord by deceiving his brother about something entrusted to him or left in his care or stolen, or if he cheats him or if he finds lost property and lies about it, or if he swears falsely or he commits any such sin that people may do, then uh, he becomes guilty. And then it goes on, this is under the, the guilt offering. So there are intentional sins. It's not just unintentional sins. Um, in terms of uh, the, the Trinity and saying Christian mothers teach this to their children, well, hopefully they are teaching them that. If you're a Christian mother, I hope you are doing that. But as I pointed out, the, the experience of God's people in the Tanakh was triadic. There was the tri the transcendent God, there was uh, the, the messenger of his presence, and there was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit can be grieved. It's not just God's power or force. It's, it, he, he is this person. Um, now, re regarding the Mormons, uh, uh, it's not fair to say, I've heard you say this a few times, but it's not fair to say that the Mormons are there so that Christians can know how Jews feel. There's a massive difference between Christianity and Mormonism. Jesus was Jewish. Joseph Smith was an American citizen. Jesus was in Israel. Joseph Smith's in the United States. Um, you know, J Jesus is at the time of the temple. I mean, he's actively involved in that, the, very, the, the very life of Israel, whereas Joseph Smith is involved in, in sort of a, a church discussion. So I, I just think that the parallels uh, aren't really accurate. Um, but again, thank you, and I'll finish there. Your timing is 
I don't know, do you have, oh, yeah. Okay. I thought you had sort of some internal clock. Great. Well, we have uh, a five-minute final response from Tavia, and then, as I said, uh, please be preparing your questions so that you can be succinct, so that you can be clear, um, but do listen at the same time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel. Um, the fact that Mormonism is so different than evangelical Protestant Christianity, that is the point. The point is the Mormon religion is reading its beliefs into the Christianity. It's reading it backward. Let's take a look at what it says. You'll see it for yourself. Let's take a look again at 1 Samuel 15, verse 29. There's nothing more destructive that you could do to yourself than idolatry, than worship anyone but HaKoshibar. He loves you. You're his daughter. Your children to the Lord your God. So listen carefully. Really, this is, the Jews are saying it's just so dangerous to smoke. I know it feels good. I know I'm sorry if that offends you, but it really is that much at stake. That's why I flew so far to be here with you. This is the words, 1 Samuel 15, 29. You can look at anybody you want. Listen, we'll do it slow. The glory of Israel does not lie. What's the reason? In Indonesian, kenapa, why? He loy Odumhu because he's not a man. Doesn't he Samuel respond to Numbers 23 19? I didn't quote that, because I know about this. It's not what it says. The glory of Israel doesn't lie because he's not a man. It says also in Hosea chapter 11, verse 9, Anachiesh Velay El. It's there's nothing could be more clear than this. Now, as it turns out that if we go, we'll talk about sacrifice very, very briefly. The sacrificial system was there for the weakest form since. What is being addressed is that Christians believe that without the shedding of blood, there is no atonement. That verse does not exist in the Jewish scriptures. I know you believe it is, it isn't there. It's from Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. As it turns out, only the weakest types of sin can be atoned through sacrifice. What did the people of Nineveh do to atone for their sins? Why would God forgive them? What sacrifices do they offer? The answer is none. And God forgave them in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. They forgave them. No sacrifice, no blood, no offering, no Hebrews chapter 10, nothing. None of that. No Hebrews chapter 9, no Romans chapter 6. How did God ever forgive them? And they were very righteous people. In fact, we are told in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4 that the greatest king of the Jewish people that ever lived and whoever will live was Hezekiah. Uh, you explain that to me if it's Jesus. Look it up for yourself. It's inside Tanakh. Kindlech, we have to get back to the holy text, to the original text. Why would it tell us that, that Chizkiah Melch, Chizkiah Melch was a holy man, is beyond on the scope of this, con this conversation to go into, but he was such a great person. One day he'll come on a tour with me, I'll show you why he was such a beautiful person. How he was the greatest man, and we had our kings like Yotam, who never sinned in his life ever, not one. And we, other, we have Osniel ben Kenas in Judges chapter 3, verse 9, who was a, a Mashiach, he was a savior for the Jewish people. How is that possible? And why am I not read these verses in my churches? You won't hear them there. It's not that there's a conspiracy, it's just part of a, a long, long pattern that unfortunately what's happening is it's the Christian Bible, it's Matthew, studying Matthew, and then through that filter, so we learn this verse, we have a fulfillment citation, read this communications card, look up this verse, it follows that verse, and that's how it's learned. If you study it that way, wow, well, you'll be in so much trouble. Now, Samuel did raise Leviticus chapter 5, but that proves the point. Leviticus chapter 5 and 6 is discussing a very unique sacrifice. It's not the sin sacrifice, but it's a, it's a carbon arsham, a guilt Offering. It's not sin but guilt. What's the heck difference? Did you ever learn this at church? Never in your life. So you have to look it up for yourself. The Korban Arshim is very be beautiful. And it's Hakush Baruch is uses this for one unique kind of person. You will find when you read these chapters that there's a very unique situation. We have a person who sins, sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. Hatzad HaShav HaShabahem, what do they have in common? They realize I did a bad thing. No one caught me, I stole it, I took something, I said something not right, and I wasn't caught, there wasn't enough evidence. And he felt very bad, and the next day he, he's made and he comes forward, I did this terrible thing. So for that person, because he mitigated against the 
force of the sin that he originally committed. For you, I will allow a carbon oshem. That's why it says in Isaiah 83, he will make his soul an oshem, and a guilt offering. It means that, oh, you confess your sin and you didn't have to. You weren't caught like the thief who has to pay back double. You are going to allow that. But you have to address the question here in 1 Kings chapter 8. Why is it that Shlema Melech says, King Solomon says, that when you're in exile and you're in the land, you're in his fire in here, turn back to this place. I will hear your prayers in heaven and forgive you for all your iniquity. Why isn't there Jesus Christ there? Why do we find John 17, 3, this is eternal life, they may know thee, and the only true God who now said, the, uh, Jesus Christ now said, and the only true God that said, why is it there? The reason it's not there, because it's not a part of God's salvation plan. Thank you so much for joining me here. Fantastic. So Brianna's got the, uh, the mic here. She will bring it out. We will uh, dedicate about 20 minutes for questions. As I said, uh, just put up your hand. Brianna will come. And we have the first question back here. And uh, can you just say who your question is for first? Oh, sorry. Um, thank you guys for um, debating with us. Uh, this question is for Tavaya. Sorry, I did miss like the first 10 minutes of your talk, so I'm not sure if you address this. But my question is, I assume you've read what Jesus said and did and what he promised to do. Uh, I, even though I know you don't accept it as scripture, I just like assume that you've read like Matthew, Mark, Luke and John because you referred a lot to them. Um, he was, in my opinion, far greater than Hezekiah, who I have read about. My question is, what more are you waiting for in a Messiah? Thank you. Well, the question is that Jesus himself admitted that he's greater than these other people. But as it turns out, we discussed this in the early part of, as it turns out, the fact that the head of a religion says, I don't believe that Jesus said these things. He certainly, I would find it very hard to believe that Jesus would say things like John 14, 6, I'm the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But what we do as a Jew, not as a Jew, I take that word back. We love Hashem, wherever you're from. We love Hashem. We say, no, nah, okay. So we have this book that says that this man 2,000 years ago made such extraordinary claims about himself. Well, what do we do? Don't we test these texts? So we, these are very serious claims. So we go back to Tanakh and we say, do we find this? And if Tanakh says, no, that's not the case. No, we have the greatest Davidic king ever, that's Chizkyo HaMelech. And we have the Davidic, we have great holy people who never sinned, who are great holy people. We say, look, I know the Christian Bible is very nice, it reads very sweet, it's very beautiful, but it's just not the word of Hashem, and therefore we reject it because it's inconsistent with the Jewish scripture. What Christians are doing, and I think, Forgive me, but you kind of italicize my point. What Christians are doing is they are beginning with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I can see the whole debate. If you begin with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that is your postulate, yeah, then, of course, you can believe anything you want to do, just as you'd be able in any other religious book, holy book. What you have to do, I would submit to you, and I don't think any Christian could argue, is you have to begin with the Jewish scriptures and then test the fantastic claims of the church against these, against what it says in the original scriptures. And if no matter how beautiful, I know Jesus comes off beautiful, but how beautiful is none of these things occurred. Even what we heard earlier from Samuel that Jesus spoke about what would happen and the destruction, Jerusalem will fall by the sword. But we are told in Luke that you can't prove something from Luke that Luke predicts the destruction of the temple. And then I said to you, if you open almost almost Christian, almost any, not all, almost any Christian Bible, not just liberal, up to a conservative, Luke is generally dated after the temple is destroyed. Most do. This is not a Jewish position. But you can't prove something because you happen to believe on faith. You have to believe in the text. But also it says in the same Luke chapter 21 in verse 32 that the, you will see the glory of the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven and this generation will not pass before that happens. Well, it didn't happen as it turns out. The generation passed and nothing happened. Not only did anything happen, but the world was brought into a deep darkness that continues for thousands of years. And we're waiting for the true Mashiach who's going to bring a real peace. And in fact, when the Mashiach comes, all the world will know that I am Hashem. And their eyes, that's why everybody's eyes is on Yerushalayim today. My friends, that's why it's so important that I'm here. 
Time really is running short. This is serious. This is not an academic thing. It's not a debate. That who, the question, time is running short. Eyes are turning to Jerusalem. Anyways, thank you for your question. OK, I'll, had, is your question for Sam? OK, is there a question for Sam? Just here. We'll come to you next. So I'm giving three minute uh, responses. Sam, do you have a good response to the scrutiny that was made about uh, the Bible that you rely on? Because it's a translation from Hebrew. And do you have, I don't know, something to add on to the fact that maybe you read the same words differently or the translated? Does it make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah it, it is important to be able to read the scriptures in their original language. Uh, however, I want to say we're doing this debate in English and we can talk about those ideas in English and translation is possible. And when it comes to the English translation, uh, Christians work very hard at this and they don't work on it uh, by themselves. They work in it in conjunction with, with Jewish speakers as well. So Christians are very uh, d deliberate about not wanting to read their own ideas back into the Old Testament, but to read it on its own terms. When I was studying at Theological College, a number of my textbooks were by uh, rabbinic scholars, and that's just what I read as well. Now, hang on, what was the rest? What was the first part of your question again? Make sure I. Oh, it's just about. Um, do you have a response to the the critique of the fact that I know you and I would rely on an English translation? Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, what I've tried to do. Is, so I've, I've affirmed that yes, knowing the original language is, of course. The, the best way to go, but translations are made because they are effective. And if a translation's not good, then of course you, you can point that out, and we do that. And um, um, uh, I was going to say something else with that. We interact with commentaries, which bring this up, but uh, again, you know, we want to take that seriously. But this is my point. What I have tried to do tonight is to give you the big picture. So when I was talking about Joseph and how Joseph suffered before entering his glory, how Daniel suffered before entering his glory, how David suffered before entering his glory, when I was doing that, that's going to come through on any translation. And, and that's why I tried to do that, because I didn't want to just say, here is a particular verse. And when I was looking at the third day, I was looking at, you know, uh, Abraham's on the third day, Joseph is on the third day, you know, like the, the, all these things of, the, of, of this pattern, like there's... The, the number 12 has a pattern, the number 40 has a pattern, the number 3 has a pattern, it has certain things. And so, you know, all of that stuff stands in the translations and so that's what I was trying to do tonight. Yeah. Okay, I believe we had a question for Tavia here. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Uh, Rabbi Tovia, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I've really never heard anyone speak that passionately about anything, so thank you very much. Um, I want to ask you a question about Genesis, uh, sorry, yeah, Genesis 22. Um, in verses 7 and 8, in the exchange between Isaac and Abraham, um, Isaac asks his father, uh, where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And then Abraham says, God will provide the ram, uh, sorry, God will provide the lamb. But in verse 13, um, Abraham sees a ram caught in the thickets. Um, we both know what the Christian interpretation of that passage is. Um, how would you respond to that? Um, and if I, if I may, uh, a request of you as well. Um, it's been uh, great. Um, I've always wanted to hear the ironic blessing pronounced in Hebrew, so I was wondering if you would be able to <laughs> speak that blessing over us as well at some point. As it turns out, I, I am a priest. A little over 100 generations ago, there lived a man who, who died on the first day of the fifth month. His name was Aaron Akoyin, he's my great-great-grandfather. In fact, in our family, I could trace myself back directly back to Moses' brother. We're only allowed to, as priests, only do what HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us, that's why the children of Israel told in Numbers chapter 6, be careful, the this is how you speak, the, you priests. 
We're not allowed to add a word or take away from it. Nothing. May Hashem's countenance shine upon you. Be careful with the name of God. I know I've used it here tonight, but I'm, I, I, I'm doing it because it's really to save you, and I don't want there to be any ambiguity. Normally, Jews don't use these names of God unless in prayer or from the text. But I do it for a special reason this evening. I got your your first part of your question was related to Genesis 22. It's really so beautiful. I'm going to move quickly because there's going to bell, bell comes. The question is that Avram is ascending the the mountain with Yitzchak, and Yitzchak said, "This is the wood, the fire, but where 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 is the animal? Where is the lamb?" And and Avram Avinu, Abraham, our father, blessed memory says, "Hakadosh Baruch Hu will show you the lamb." Now, when we get up, well, finally, when Abraham is born, I don't want the human side. I want you to uh, bring the ram. I don't want, want to talk about the relationship of a lamb to a ram. I want to jettison that and show you something very beautiful. Abraham was not just talking for the moment. He's talking for all history. There will be a time, there will be a time 400 and roughly 430 years later, after that event, a little bit earlier, about 420 years later, well, one day the children of Israel are going to be challenged. They're going to be living in Egypt. And as it turned out, the Egyptians worshipped the lamb as a god. In India, they worship a, the Hindus worship a, 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 a cow as a god. In, the, in Egypt, the lamb was holy. If they caught you killing a lamb, they would put you to death. In fact, when Moshe Rabbeinu, our teacher, stood before, uh, before fa- fa- Pharaoh, for Paro, Pharaoh says, what do you need? They go out to the wilderness to bring your offerings. Bring them here. Not a problem. And my should have been turned back to us. If we're going to bring our offerings here, you're going to kill us for that. Because the lamb was an avoid deserve, was idolatry. One day the children of Israel are going to be there and it's going to come to the time of the Exodus and God's going to test us like he tested Abraham and he's going to say the following. He's going to say, you are, what are you, who do you fear more? Do you fear more the Egyptian army or do you fear the God of Israel? And those who are willing to sacrifice a lamb, those are the people who are worthy to save. The point is that the lamb is not a sin offering, it's a righteous offering. Who brought the lamb? Only those who feared God more than they feared Pharaoh. Thank you for that question. Okay. Uh, as you can see from the questions, any questions good. You don't have to be up. So go for it. If you've got a, is there a question here? Is he, who's your question for? Okay. Have we got another question for Sam? I want both. Okay. It shouldn't take too long. Thank you. Uh, what do you do about the Apocrypha or the Septuagint? Do you want to Could you repeat the question? Um, the Catholics get their Old Testament from the Greek Old Testament, which includes extra books than the Hebrew Old Testament, called the Apocrypha or the Deuterocanonical books. Do you want to? Do you want to answer, Sam? Do you, we'll, we'll take okay, this as a Sam question. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, there are different canons uh, when it comes to to the to the scriptures, and from my understanding, the, uh, the the Catholic Church recent uh, recently several hundred years ago uh, authorized those apocryphal books in a much clearer way than they had before, um, but the Greek Orthodox Church has those extra apocryphal books. And from my understanding, it's because they're following different canons from different, and this is where Tovia can help us here, but they're following different canons from different Jewish communities. So there was the Egyptian Jewish community and the Palestinian Jewish community. And uh, from my understanding, it's, uh, you know, Protestant Christians that followed the Palestinian Jewish canon, but there was this, this other canon with the LXX, um, there's the Septuagint translation which was there before Christianity, and some people followed that. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll address it. 
So, I, I, thank you. There's actually two questions here that I, I'll, I'll segregate for you to make it easier. The, there are books, Swarm Hachitsoinim, books that are not the Word of God, but have a very interesting, whether they have the Book of Maccabees, so the Catholic Church considers that to be a holy book. It's not a holy book. It's not the Word of Hashem. It's not sacred. This is something that we both agree with. There's also the works of Ben Sira, who's actually a very important work, a very important Proverbs in it, but just not the Word of God. Scripture is canon. Canon means a read, that which can be measured. And therefore, we don't use other books have value historically. They're just not the word of God. We don't, a salvation not dependent on it. Now we're talking about the LXX. This is a very important thing for you to know. And that is the original Septuagint. It's called the Targum Shivim, which was translated roughly in the uh, 2,250 years ago. You're quite correct. It was a quarter of a millennia before the Christian era. Was only of the five books of Moses. Be very careful with this. You get into huge trouble. The original Septuagint was only only a translation into Greek of the Torah, nothing else. You don't need Jewish sources on this. You can go to the Jerome's introduction to First Chronicles, Josephus, Talmo, Eddie. There is, you open any Septuagint, it will tell you that in the introduction. What happened later is there are many, many Greek translations that were introduced over and over. Read, I don't often recommend the King James to be, well, I'm kidding, but I don't mean that in a, in a pejorative way, but in the, in the introduction to the King James, the original 1611 version, the 47 translators write this down that it was a, a problematic translation over and over. Origen was the final editor of what you have today as a Septuagint. That's why today Septuagint have the apocryphal text. And what is the wisdom of Solomon doing in there? The wisdom of Solomon almost certainly was originally written in Greek. Why did they translate it? The original Septuagint is only five books most, and it is lost. We don't have it today. What you get on Amazon is not the original Septuagint. Scholars know this, but unfortunately this is not widely known in the laity. So I hope that answers some of your questions. Okay, thank you so much. say something on that because I happen to bring a quote on the Septuagint. Um, come up, come use the mic. Yeah. yeah. And then, what, then so, we'll hear um, this question. When I was researching on this, because I had the advantage tonight of being able to watch Tovia's answers, whereas he didn't have an advantage to, to see what I said. When I, w I looked up a book by Emmanuel Tov, which is called Textual Criticism of the Hebrew Bible, and he, he puts forward evidence for the, the rest of the Tanakh being translated before that time. Um, I, I won't go much further, but to say uh, Emmanuel Tov, textual criticism of the Hebrew Bible, and it was page 137 where he, he puts forward his evidence there. So I guess um, I, I, I think we need to do a bit more work on that. Really, it, what, it's not to disagree with him, but I want to, but because we're going yeah, yeah, back, yeah. I, I, I'm familiar with Emmanuel Tov's work. I just, yeah. just a point, Thank not you. to disagree. No, 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 no. Yeah. no. Not to disagree. When the word Septuagint is used, it's a capital S. It's very much the word, it read Tov on this, these words became genericized. So if I say, please, Xerox is paid for me. Now, as it turns out, Xerox is a company, but it was so popular that people started, oh, Kleenex, I got a cold. Could you be a Kleenex? Kleenex is a company too. These words became genericized. So therefore, of course, people went and translated the Bible into the Greek language. They needed, especially for the North African Jewish community. No one disagrees. That means we're on the same page. That's my point. Point. The point is that's not the Septuagint that was done before the Christian era. We know about this and we have testimonies all over to it. The point is that the original Septuagint of the five books of Moses, but it is true that subsequent translations into Greek, they all then use the term Septuagint, which means Septuagint means, you hear the Latin there, 70 or 72. That's the point. That's not, your Septuagint is not the original Septuagint. It's that you see it in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, when Jesus is reading from the scroll in the synagogue. Now, it's a misquote from, from Isaiah chapter 61. It doesn't say Jesus read from a Septuagint. People say, Jesus quoted from the Septuagint. It's not true. It says he went to the synagogue. He was reading from Isaiah. That's not a Septuagint. Anyways, thank, but that's not a disagreement. Just yeah. be careful. The words are thrown around. And maybe I'll be the last person to ever share this with you. This could be, mis this could be complicated. Yeah, Anyways, no. Thank you, Samuel. That's, that, that's helpful. Thank you. Was it helpful for you, though? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so I have two questions, uh, mainly for curiosity's sake, so bear with me, guys. The first one was, I think you've used Kindershem. 
is the word to des- are you describing all of us or just Jews? Or am I like I think that's the word you were using? Kinderla. 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 I, I, maybe I missed it because you explained at the start. So what does that mean? And are you referring to all of us or just the Jews? And the second one is wh- who or what are the Nephilim? Do you have a, a more kind of <laughs> sorry? It, it's something I've always been curious about. Um, do you have a better answer for the Nephilim? <laughs> Oh, beautiful. Kinderlach. So Kinderlach is in Hebrew, as it turns out. It's a Yiddish word. Kinder is the same word in German, because 85% of the Yiddish language is German. Kinderlach means children. Judaism believes is where this is a universal faith for every person. I know Christians think, oh, the Jews think they're the only ones. We're not. We believe the whole world, you are creating the image of Hashem, and so are you. And we don't believe God is a white man. Remember that. And therefore, each one of you has a neshama, a chelik limal mamish, mamish from heaven. Hashem loves you. Your dog, as much as you love your little dog, that dog is not creating the image of God, and you, sir, are. We just, the Jews have a role that is to be a light to the nations. And then you have the second question. Remind me just. Nephilim. The question is, what's going on in Genesis chapter 6? What's going on? Sorry, the English came through again. What's going on there? What happened there was, what happened? Angels came down and had sex with women, and then there was a flood, and the angels who did it got away with it. That doesn't make any sense at all. Nephilim means to fall. And these are men who are very powerful. Now, they're called B'nai Elohim because in Tanakh, we don't talk this way, but in Tanakh, powerful people are called Elohim or B'nai Elohim. Judges are called Elohim. Havu Lashem B'nai Elim. It just means powerful evil. What happened, this Genesis 6 is our introduction to what did that generation do so horribly that God brought about the flood? And why were they punished and destroyed? Only eight people survived. So it begins by saying, here's number one, very powerful people, B'nai Elohim came, and they fell, that's why they're called Nafal, Nafal means to fall, and they raped women who were weak and forced them to have their children. Abuse of women, the Me Too movement didn't start now, the raping of women didn't start in Hollywood, it started thousands of years ago, and this is often read as angels, if angels had sex with women? And then if they're angels, then the flood happens, and the angels go, ha, ah, this is a sick God, that God would destroy the victims and not the perpetrators? It doesn't make sense. Why would God bring a flood to punish those who committed a crime? If it was angels, that they would never commit, that they got away, because they're flying all over the place, go, ha, ah. the whole story doesn't make any sense. I know this is how it's taught, I know how it's quoted, Nafal means to fall, it's a very similar, but only one thing, children, <laughs> only one thing, we not, the Navi, the prophets, do not use our dictionary. They speak in a convention that's not our convention. If you impose our conventional speaking that children of God, sounds to us like you're a son of God. But as it turns out, Tanakh, people are the son of God. We're all the son of God. You are a son of Hashem. The Jew, as I said, only had, the Christians think that we think we're only saved. We don't. All the people who serve Hashem and keep the seven no high laws, it's a little complicated, but we're servant to Hashem, reject all idolatry, save eternal life because you're creating the image of Hashem. Right here, Hashem blew it right in. That's why people walk like this. So therefore, the answer to your question is, it's not angels, you'll be told that. It's human beings, or powerful human beings, who raped women and forced them to have their children. How are angels having sex with, with women having babies, and then the angels get away with murder. It makes no sense. And then the text also continues. The robbery, incidentally, if there's no Noahide laws, what were they punished for? There was no such commandment. The answer is these are pre synodic laws. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, who's your question for? Right. Is there another one for Sam? Over here. Okay, so um, first of all, I just wanted to say that you guys are really knowledgeable and my question might be really simple in comparison. Um, So it's just a question on the usage of a term, a little bit of language. So the word son of God is used interchangeably with son of man, I see in the Old Testament and like the new one. Like, are you able to clarify the meaning of that term to me? Sure, thank you. First of all, you never save yourself that, you know, you. You shouldn't be asking questions or it's too simple because we've 
we've all got to start somewhere and praise God that you're wanting to learn about his word and, and that's fantastic. Um, so the, the phrase son of God or the, the title son of God is used in various ways throughout the, uh, I'd say throughout the Tanakh, the Old Testament and, um, and, and into the New Testament. So it is used sometimes of angels. So in the book of Job, the sons of God present themselves before, uh, be, before the Lord. Um, and so it, it's used that way. But the, the main use in the Tanakh, in the Old Testament, is a way of speaking about the son of David. And so in 2 Samuel chapter 7, God makes a covenant with King David and he says to King David, uh, David, I will make a house, a dynasty for you, and um, to your son, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And then we see that Solomon in the book of Chronicles is actually called the son of God, and God is his father, and, and Solomon rules over the, the kingdom of the Lord on earth. And so, so the phrase son of God uh, is a, another title for, uh, for, for, for the kings of Israel who are the descendants of David which is interesting because it means when you're reading the books of Kings and Chronicles, you're reading about the sons of God. You're reading about the, the Messiah kings. And it's interesting when you read their stories, you see that they have this messianic role where when God's wrath is coming upon the people of Israel, the, this king, because of who his relationship is, he can stand between God and, and the people and he can actually turn aside God's wrath. So if he repents, what he does affects everybody else. And uh, sometimes it goes the wrong, the, the, the wrong way when David takes a census and it, it goes badly for the people. So that they have this unique role as a son of God. Now, the son of man particularly comes out of <coughs> um, uh, Daniel chapter 7. And that has to do with, uh, in many ways, um, the, the, the destiny of humanity. So in Daniel chapter 7, you've got all these nations of the world which are beastly. That is, they're meant to be in the image of God and living like men, you know, living as the image of God. But instead, they're godless and they're, they're beastly. And, uh, and, and so God's kingdom is not, being, is not established on earth. And so Daniel has this vision of one like a son of man coming who's the true image of God. And he comes and um, receives the kingdom on behalf of God's people. And so he, 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 you need to compare him to the beasts. There's the beasts who are not living as they should, as hum humans should, and there's this one who is living as a human should, and, and he takes on um, uh, the, 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 the rule and authority of God on earth, and so he rules uh, as humanity should. And so Jesus picks up both of these phrases for himself, and so sometimes he calls himself the son of man, particularly when he's speaking about his own authority and his authority to, to be the ruler of all things. Um, and sometimes he will speak of himself as the son of God when he's talking about um, you know, messianic promises back to David. So um, it's a good type of thing you can do where you can do a word search or ask Paul and he'd help you with that. Okay, I think we'll have one more question for Tavia. Is yours for Tavia? Yes, do you want to ask yours later after, after the... Who's your fault? For Tavia. Okay. I, we've already used our 20 minutes, so I'm going to... I think you had your, your hand up first, to be honest. So. Sorry. Thank you very much. Um, Rabbi Tovia, both Jew and Gentiles, they are under the curse of sin. For yourself, the land that you live in, under your house, the land is cursed. And with all respect, there will be a time where you also die. You're under that curse too. Can you tell us why your pursuit of, of for righteousness is actually working? It's a very interesting thing that the land is cursed. And the coming of the true Messiah will change that. And we'll turn back to a previous state. I would posit to you that there's no greater witness that Jesus is not the Messiah than we are living in a time when the land is still cursed. For if he was the Messiah, the land wouldn't be cursed. Things would be changed. But we are living on cursed land, and the land is a witness, a testimony. Give, look up at the sky, look up at the land. Is it cursed? That means the Messiah has not yet come. 
I would suggest to you there is no greater proof that the Messiah has not come yet because the land is still in the state of curse. It's interesting that Jesus saved us from things that you can't measure, test, things that would never in this university could never be measured and never would. But when we look at the land, we in fact discover the Mashiach has not yet come. And yet the second part to your question, if you just hold that, well, your second part is um, of the resurrection of the dead? The greatest curse apart from the land oh, that you will die. Right, so, but the Bible tells us that when the true Messiah comes, what's going to happen? Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. There are many who lie on the earth that will arise to everlasting life and others to everlasting contempt and damnation. Read Isaiah chapter 26, verse 19 for yourself. Techias amazing, the resurrection of the dead, that believe in the corporal resurrection is fundamental. It's one of the main, 13 main principles of the Jewish faith. As it turns out, it didn't happen, but we are looking forward to it. That's why Yeshaya, Isaiah, calls those who died Sheikh Ne'ofer, those are temporary dwellers in the grave. That's why Shem leaves over bones, because the bones are not destroyed. But the cremation, they have, to, they have to grind the bones. It's a terrible thing. So therefore, the resurrection of the dead will occur. And I would say this to you, what greater proof is there when we look at the world today? And we see that people are dying and the graves remain still and the earth remains cursed. One other thing, and I, how do you get your righteousness? Deuteronomy 30, verse 14. The law is the Torah is not too hard for yourself. Moses disagrees with Paul, and if I have a disagreement between Moses and Paul, I'm going with Moses every time. Deuteronomy 30 verse 14 says, "The law is not too hard for you; it's not far off. It's in your heart that you may do it." And you know what Paul does with that in Romans chapter 10 verse 6 through 8? Roman he expunges it. How could he do that? I'm not kidding. It says in Deuteronomy 30 that people say to you, "The law is far off; it's over. the heavens will bring it to you." It's over the sea to us. Don't think such a thing. It's not. It's near to you. It's in your heart. And look at the end of verse 30, verse 14. Deuteronomy 30, 14. This one verse, you look at this, it'll change your life. It says that you may do it. Now, if you have a Christian Bible, it cross-references that to Romans chapter 6, verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 6 to 8. But when Paul quotes it, he actually deletes, he cuts out, he expunges, he jettisons the critical word that you may do it. HaKosh Baruch Hu loves you, you can do it. He would never, crazy God would give you laws that you can't keep. HaKosh Baruch Hu is more merciful than you can ever be. And for him, we are so thankful that HaKosh Baruch Hu gave us the blessing to be together here today. Thank you so much. Okay, apologies. I know there are people with their hands up. and But we do have four minutes each now for concluding statements and then that will take us about a quarter of an hour over the advertised finish time. So thanks for staying with us and let's hear first from Sam. Yep. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight and for wanting to take seriously the things of God. Uh, because God is our creator and we do need to listen to him and to see how he's acted in this world and, uh, and, and in many ways go against the flow of our society here in Australia. So uh, I want to thank you for coming out. I want to thank Tavia again for coming over to be part of this. It's been great just to talk straight with each other. Um, this, is, you know, th 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 this is fantastic that we can do this uh, and, uh, and we need to do it. We need to do it. And again, I want to thank uh, Credo and uh, everyone at UTS and the, the Student Society who organised this. Thank you for all your efforts and persevering and getting the rooms at the last minute. That's fantastic. Um, I'll just go over my talk again and ask you to, to think about these things and to go and investigate it further for yourself. Because that's what I'm trying to do tonight is to, uh, to, to put, put forward the evidence and it's the type of thing that it might take you a while to work through. And so that's what I'm wanting to put forward. So again, I've, uh, I've contended that John the Baptist and Jesus are the only fulfillment possible for Malachi chapter 3, verse 4, because uh, now that the temple's destroyed, there can be no Lord coming and Elijah coming to his temple. So if it's not Jesus and John, then who is it? And so I'll leave that with you to go and think about... The, who does fulfill that? 
Uh, my second point was that I showed that the Messiah would suffer and then enter his glory and that that is the overwhelming pattern throughout the whole Old Testament. And I'm, I'm not reading into it at that point. It's just that's just what you see in Joseph. He suffers before entering his glory. Uh, David suffers before entering his glory. Daniel does. And so that's what we see with Jesus. And so that's how I, I see Jesus fulfilling that there. I said that this is confirmed by the prophecy of Isaiah 53 and you're going to have to go away and read that and see who is it speaking about and listen to what Tovi and I have said and see that. And then uh, again, as I said, uh, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. Uh, people want to say, well, if, what if it was written after that? Well, you're going to have to, again, I guess, look at that. But what we do want to say is that that was a big event that happened around Jesus' life. Uh, a significant event happened within that generation. And so you've got to think something about that. What does it mean that the temple was destroyed within that generation? What does that mean? Um, we, we looked at the miracles of Jesus and, uh, and his resurrection from the dead as further proof. Um, uh, finally, I, I pointed out that the, 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 that the Old Testament type of worship, the, the Old Testament experience of God was in fact triadic with the transcendent God the angel of uh, the messenger, the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit. And I was pointing out that that revelation of God is consistent with what we have today. My final point is to say th the reason why I believe you need Jesus is just getting back to something that Tovi has brought up. And that is, I don't think you can keep the law. When I read the Tanakh, I don't come away from it thinking Israel can keep the law. Well, what I come away thinking is, in fact, Isaiah and Ezekiel both say that my name has been blasphemed among the nations because of Israel. And I'm not blaming Israel in particular, because if I was there, I would have done exactly the same thing. But the Old Testament finishes you know, with, with no hope for us on ourselves being able to save ourselves or to keep God's law. We need God to do something for us. That's just how I see the Old Testament. I can't see any hope in the Old Testament that after judges, kings, all these things where they've remained under the wrath of God because they can't live that perfect life, well, it's only going to come about when God saves us. We can't save ourselves. And that's what God does for us in Jesus. Thank you very much. I uh, want to take these last few moments to uh, really uh, thank Samuel Green for joining me here this evening. Thank you so much. Um, I thank the young men and women of Credo and Paul, thank you, Brianna, thank you so much for making so much so possible. For so many, it's very clear to me that the children of Israel are often misunderstood. I only beg one thing of you. Don't learn about Judaism from Christians, learn from a Jew. Just like, you, you know, you wouldn't want Jews to be learning Christianity from, from rabbis. Come to the Jewish people, we're friendly folks. We, every person is created in the image of Hashem, every single person. But a Baruch Hu, the Almighty, blessed be his name, you should know today, that the Lord is God, places on your heart, Malvart, Mitachas ain't owed, there is no one else besides him. Remember, Watch your soul. Read Deuteronomy chapter 4. Be careful with your soul very much. Watch your soul. Why? Because you didn't see any image on the day that you heard the voice of God from the fire that came out of the mountain. And that's what's very important. You know, I wanna, I'm sitting here in a technical university, so I want to explain a point that people may have missed. Let's use geometric thinking for a moment. And that is that we have postulates and we have theorems in geometry as an example. Postulates are things that we agree on, that, are, that require no evidence, they're self-evident, right? That's how geometry begins, first day. There are things that we know are true and they're axiomatic. And A squared plus B squared is not one of them. That is proven from the postulates so therefore, what happens when you're learning geometry? Let's just use the language of God, because math is, in a way, the language of God. This whole world is math, after all. Let's do it that way. So what we have is we have postulates. That's Tanakh. 
And then from all the postulates which we know is true, and what do we know is true? Genesis through Malachi, Moshe and Avraham Avinu. That's why Abraham and Moses, these great men of blessed memory. This we know is true. And then we go and try to find the theorems. What is the what is the a squared plus b squared equals c squared? If two sides of a triangle equal, are their opposite angles equal? That's not axiomatic. We don't go, it's a beautiful story that Joseph suffered, he was rejected, but it turns out all religions have people who died and suffered, they can't all be true. You can't use a homily, it's good for a, it's not that rabbis, we don't have homilies, but we don't follow, find the theology, we don't have salvation homilies. We start with things that are absolutely known, and then this is the basic law of hermeneutics. You have to learn this in church, and what we do is we go back to the original. We go back to the text. What does it say? Vatikrim vatamdun tachazahar, and the people, you stood under the mountain, and the mountain was, the fire of the mountain went up to the heaven. God spoke to you from the fire. You heard the voice of God. Usmuna and of an image light is him. Remember, you said at Mount Sinai. You heard the voice of Hashem, but you saw no image. There's no one else besides me. Hashem loves every one of you. You created the Solomon Elikim in the image of Hashem, and Hashem just wants to be close to you, but no text messaging anybody else. Nobody on the side, no boyfriends on the side, girlfriends, no flowers, no hearts to anybody else, just me. I can't share you with anybody else. I don't, Hashem doesn't want, no boyfriend, don't send your ex-boyfriend birthday cards, nothing. Could you think you could be loyal to me? I love you very much. That's the message of Judaism. Thank you so much for having me here this evening. Hello. Great, thank you so much for your patience. I'll, I'm gonna ask for a little bit more patience because Brianna is going to come and do some formal thank yous and also ask for your responses. So I'll hand back to Brianna now. I'm too short for that. Um, thank you. Well, I think we're all just overwhelmed with how knowledgeable and amazing the debates are. So let's please give them a round of applause to thank you for them.